Good afternoon. In advance for your attention, I know that this can sometimes be a marathon. Um, it's a lot of information to cover, even for each speaker, let alone all of you. Um, I'm happy to stay around in the back of the room during any other breaks um, if people have questions for me that I don't cover during um, this talk. There have been a few minor changes in the slides from what's on your, um, in your handouts, but nothing substantial. I'll try to point those out along the way. So I'll start with uh, neuroblastic tumors. We've been talking about neuroblastic tumors and renal tumors um, this afternoon. Neuroblastic tumors are a brinal malignancy that originates from the neural crest tissue of sympathetic nervous systems. This category encompasses everything from benign tumors, ganglioneuromas, all the way to malignant tumors, neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma is the second most common solid neoplasm in childhood and accounts for 8 to 10 percent of all pediatric tumors. It is the most common tumor in children less than one year of age. The epidemiology um, is pretty simple. It occurs in young children. Median age of 19 months, there's a slight male predominance. There doesn't appear to be any ethnic predisposition, although um, there are studies now that show that African Americans and Native Americans do worse overall. The, the boards wants you to know the cytogenetic and molecular genetic abnormalities, both for these tumors as well as the renal tumors. And I tried to divide these into what, are, what is known for germline genetic abnormalities as well as somatic um, abnormalities. So for neuroblastoma, the most important are the familial neuroblastoma. Familial neuroblastoma is a syndrome that's been well reported for decades, occurring in about 1 to 2 percent of neuroblastomas, but it was really only in the last 15 years that the genetic predisposition for this has been identified. And it includes two um, genetic abnormalities that accounts for nearly all of the familial neuroblastomas. The first is um, germline aberrations in the anaplastic um, lymphoma kinase gene. These children have neuroblastoma, but no other genetic abnormalities um, that are known. The FOX2B germline mutation is um, different in that it occurs in children with neuroclistopathy syndrome. So these children have central hypoventilation, Hirschsprungs, and neuroblastoma, or any of the two um, together. Other, fact, other germline mutations are noted here. I'm going to kind of breeze through these just in um, the sake of time, but they are in your handout. Somatic mutations are um, more broadly um, thought of in neuroblastoma is uh, two patterns. I think of them as huge whole chromosomal gains or losses or segmental chromosome aberrations. And this is important because um, both for just thinking through the types of genetic aberrations that are somatic in neuroblastoma, but also in prognosis. And so those tumors that have whole chromosome abnormalities generally are associated with a more favorable outcome than those tumors with segmental chromosome aber aberrations. So within the somatic aberrations, I also like to think of gains or losses. So we, most everyone in this room would know about MICN um, oncogene amplification. That's the most common genetic abnormality in neuroblastoma. It occurs in about 20% of children, but in those children um, uh, with high-risk disease, it's more like 30 to 40% of children. It's defined as greater than 10 gene copies of NMIC, and as I stated, it's associated with higher disease stage and worse outcomes. Outcome. Other aberrations include aberrations in the ALK gene, so similar aberrations that are seen in germline mutations are also seen as somatic mutations in neuroblastoma. Amplification of the ALK gene occurs in about 2 to 3 percent of tumors and sometimes can be amplified um, concurrently with the MYC gene since they are very close in proximity on chromosome 2. There are also activating point mutations um, in the tyrosine kinase domain of ALK occurring in about 10 percent of neuroblastoma. And then the third most common um, or third most important um, gain is gain of 17Q, although the actual gene associated with that gain um, is unknown at this time. Loss of genetic material, there's quite a few. The most common ones that we see and are reported are chromosome 1P, 11Q23, and 14Q32. Um, 1P is more commonly associated with MMIC amplification, while 11Q is not associated with MMIC amplification, nor uh, usually is chromosome 14Q loss. 
Other rare mutations are now being um, reported in neuroblastoma. Most of the time, um, we don't see genetic abnormalities in neuroblastoma, um, but the more commonly one, um, ones that have some ramifications on prognosis or patient cohorts include two um, abnormalities recently described um, in the telomerase pathways, the ATRX and the TERT. ATRX is very in interesting in that um, the majority of adolescents Adolescents who have neuroblastoma have ATRX mutations. It is very rarely found in young children with neuroblastoma. And then there are also mutations um, in the um, uh, arid 1A and 1B in chromatin remodeling. Okay, so moving on, the boards would like you to recognize pathologic features of neuroblastoma tumors. These are small round blue cell tumors. Depending on the type of neuroblastic tumor, you will see varying degrees of neuronal differen differentiation, but Homer Wright rosette patterns is classic for neuroblastoma. There will also be varying degrees of stroma and Schwannian intermixed with these neuroblasts um, in the various neuroblastic tumors. And then finally, varying degrees of mitosis and karyorexis. So these are some examples of neuroblastoma. Here you see a very differentiated tumor with large neuronal type cells. Here is a poorly differentiated tumor, much smaller, round blue cell tumors with less of a background of neuropil and very undifferentiated. So no evidence of ganglion differentiation. And here you see many um, mitotic indexes. And this is an example of a Homer Wright rosette pattern um, of a bone marrow metastases in neuroblastoma. Oops, sorry. Okay. Let's see if I can make this go. Maybe not. Okay. Suggestions. There we go. Um, so recognize the characteristic pathologic features. Um, we just talked about that. Let's see if I can go forward. Nope, we're going backwards. Here we go. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the International Neuroblastoma Pathology Classification. Um, this is used, as the term would suggest, internationally and takes into account the morphologic features of the tumor cells prior to therapy, the amount of differentiation, the amount of Schwannian stroma, and the amount of um, mitosis that is seen in the diagnostic specimen. And it takes all of that and puts it into criteria that also takes into account the patient's age. With the idea idea that as a child gets older, you should see more differentiation in the tumor, and, um, and those over five years of age should be fully ganglioneuroma, or they have what is classified as an unfavorable histology. What's important about that is that the INPC is an independent prognostic variable of outcome, so those children with unfavorable histology by the INPC have a worse outcome than those with favorable. Um, again, the poor prognosis is associated with less differentiation and a higher mitotic index. The clinical presentation of neuroblastoma is very heterogeneous. It has, um, goes from everything from a tumor that could be metastatic, Goodness gracious, sorry. Um, to liver and skin nodules that spontaneously regresses to very aggressive disease with widespread metastatic bone and bone marrow involvement. So therefore, the clinical presentation can be anything from coincidental finding to those who have severe symptoms based on their metastatic or primary disease. So the relationship, oh goodness gracious. <laughs> the clinical findings of neuroblastoma are really related to um, where the tumor is. So tumors associated with primary site or nodal metastatic disease, as listed here, with common ones to remember of abdominal distension, Horner syndrome from satellite ganglion involvement of neuroblastoma, or uh, paralysis from spinal cord compression. There are symptoms associated with met uh, metastatic disease, which is important to know that children with um, very aggressive neuroblastoma many times present febrile, very ill-appearing, um, without any discrete focal symptomatology. Those patients with bone or bone marrow disease can have diffuse bone pain, and then the classic raccoon eyes for the predilection of the orbital bone being um, involved with neuroblastoma. 
And then finally, those children who have the infant metastatic form for S or MS now called can have skin nodules and be part of the differential of the blueberry uh, muffin baby at birth. Okay, recognize the laboratory findings of neuroblastoma. Children with neuroblastoma will often hot times have elevation of serum or urine catecholamines, um, in particular uh, homovanolytic acid or venomandolic acid, um, and this occurs in 90% of children with neuroblastoma. Other nonspecific tumor markers, which aren't really used for diagnostic purposes anymore, are elevation of neuron-specific enolase, elevation of ferritin, or LDH. Um, and then, of course, if the tumor is uh, significantly evolved in the bone marrow, these children can sometimes have pancytopenia. The board would like you to know the association of myoclonic encephalopathy with neuroblastoma and its long-term outcome. Um, neuro myoclonic encephalopathy is also known as opsoclonus myoclonus ataxia syndrome. This occurs in about 4% of children with neuroblastoma. And it is um, characterized by monoclonic um, jerking, random eye movements with or without cerebellar ataxia. This is generally associated with a very favorable neuroblastoma, so these children have a very favorable long-term outcome as in terms of their tumor um, prognosis. However, they have long-term neurologic and cognitive deficits. This appears to be an autoimmune phenomena. We treat it with immunosuppressive um, chemotherapy, steroids, or IVIG, but it can be recurring and can lead to long-lasting developmental delay. The board would also like to know the association of intractable secretary diarrhea. Um, this is a lovely question for the boards, but I will tell you in my whole career I have only seen this once. Uh, it's called Kerner-Morrison syndrome, and it relates to secretion of vasoactive intestinal peptide from neuroblastoma that causes secretary diarrhea. Um, the diarrhea resolves when the tumor is resected. Okay, utilizing appropriate imaging modalities to determine the extent and metastatic spread of neuroblastoma. Neuroblastoma can metastasize to lymph nodes, bone, bone marrow most commonly. Liver and lungs and brain can also be seen at diagnosis. So anatomic imaging of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis is needed to look at the primary sites of tumor as well as potential for nodal metastases. Bone sites are now most usually um, evaluated using uh, nuclear imaging with MIBG scintigraphy, since 90% of tumors will um, take up MIBG. In those tumors that are MIBG non-avid, we now recommend PET scanning um, for uh, evaluating metastatic disease. In an emergency setting, uh, Technesium 99 bone scan can certainly still be used to evaluate for bone metastases, but it is no longer used in the evaluation of response um, since bone scans will remain positive for the healing bone even after neuroblastoma um, has resolved. Okay, here's some examples. Um, the things I'd like to show you, this is an adrenal mass of neuroblastoma. Many times neuroblastoma primary tumors has calcification, have calcification, so that's a hint for you when you're asked to look at an abdominal mass. Um, this is an example of an MIBG scan showing uptake in the primary mass and unfortunately metastatic bone lesions. And then finally a PET scan, which is also showing metastatic bone lesions in a patient um, with neuroblastoma. Utilization of appropriate laboratory studies to determine the extent and metastatic spread of neuroblastoma. I find this question a little bit hard since there isn't really a test, um, a laboratory test short of a bone marrow biopsy and tumor biopsy to help you look at the tumor and then bone marrow to look for sites of metastatic disease. As I mentioned, 90% of tumors will excrete catecholamines, so the diagnosis of neuroblastoma can be made in those children who have elevated VMA and HVA in their urine or serum in in addition to a bone marrow specimen suggested of neuroblastoma. The boards would also like you to know how to distinguish neuroblastoma in the bone marrow from other abnormal cells. Neuroblastoma cells um, are small, round blue cells. They're generally larger than um, neighboring lymphocytes. Sorry, this is very tricky. Um, here is, again, um, a, a homer rosette um, in the bone marrow. Neuroblastoma in the bone marrow generally is cohesive clumps of cells. They can either be in a homer rosette um, or have this 
paving stone pattern that's depicted here um, with a path of cells all clumped together. Um, very rarely can they be uniform-like, uh, uh, uniform cells, and in extreme cases, the bone marrow can be completely replaced and can be erroneously thought of as uh, acute leukemia instead of neuroblastoma. The clinical variables that are important for neuroblastoma are age, um, with uh, 18 months as a cutoff for a prognosis. Those older, those with older than 18 months do worse. Stage, so those with more advanced stage do worse. The staging system is evolving for neuroblastoma, so you could be asked either um, about the international neuroblastoma staging system on the boards. It's important to know this is a surgically based staging system. So stage one is completely um, resected. Stage two is incompletely resected with ipsilateral lymph nodes. Stage three is incompletely resected um, or not really able to be resected, biopsy only or contralateral lymph nodes. And then stage four is metastatic disease. Stage 4S is a special form of metastatic disease that occurs in infants that only has um, generally skin and liver involvement with a, just a small amount of bone marrow, if at all. These children cannot have bone metastases. The newer staging system that is now being placed into all upfront protocols in the children's oncology group, as well as all European um, protocols, is called the International Neuroblastoma Risk Group Staging System. And this was an attempt to get away from how aggressive a surgeon wanted to be for staging of neuroblastoma. So it uses imaging to define what are called risk factors, so tumors that are in Approaching and invading around and surrounding blood vessels have image-defined risk factors, whereas those that are just pushing vessels aside are not image-defined risk factors. So it divides localized tumors into L1, no image-defined risk factors, L2, image-defined risk factors, M for metastatic disease, and MS, which will take over for 4S um, disease. Know the laboratory, pathologic, and molecular biological variables that are prognostic. We've talked about some of these already. Adverse impact on prognosis. There are very old studies that show a low VMA to HVA ratio has a worse prognosis. NMIC amplification, unfavorable INPC, the evidence of segmental chromosome aberrations within the tumor, and then in infants, the evidence of tumor diploid DNA content, which may be just a surrogate marker for tumor segmental chromosome aberrations, are all worse prognosis. So risk stratification really takes all of these into consideration. So you need, in order to risk stratify a patient with neuroblastoma, you need to know the stage, you need to know the patient's age, and you need to know biologic classification characteristics of the tumor, which include the presence of endemic amplification, the presence of segmental chromosome aberrations, and you need to know the histology of the tumor. And with all of that, you can simply, I say tongue in cheek, figure out the risk stratification for neuroblastoma. So children with low stage disease, so these would be L1 tumors or MS tumors of any age with no NMIC amplification would be low risk. Intermediate risk would be local regional um, patients who have no evidence of NMIC amplification or babies less than 18 months with metastatic disease with no NMIC amplification. And high-risk disease would be those children with NMIC amplification or those children with stage 4 disease who are over 18 months. The caveat being that some children in the local regional disease who are over 18 months who have unfavorable histology have a worse outcome, and depending on where the child is born, North America or Europe, are treated either as intermediate risk or high risk. But if you take these general principles, then we can divide children into these three categories, and you can see there's a marked difference in outcome for those who have high-risk disease versus those who have non-high-risk disease. There are two risk classifications that are out there. One has been published in JCO about seven years ago, which is the International Risk Group Classification, and takes all of these factors that I just told you and puts patients into varying risk groups. This is important to realize that this is not for treatment assignment. This is really an intern a tool for the international community to be able to say who are the patients that we are treating on various treatment protocols. 
Within the children's oncology group, we have a risk stratification that mirrors the INRG risk stratification very closely, with the exceptions of some of the patients I just talked about, the local regional over 18 months with unfavorable histology, where they are treated as high-risk disease. So the difference is that the COG risk classification is your treatment assignment, not just a tool for comparing across um, clinical protocols. Okay, know the principles of treatment for the various stages of neuroblastoma. I've decided to put this into the risk classification since, as I just said, some of the, the stages can go across the risk classifications. Low risk disease is a highly curable form of neuroblastoma. Surgery is the mainstay of treatment, and we are now investigating whether observation alone for some of these very small tumors or tumors in infants can be um, a mode of therapy since some of these tumors may spontaneously regret, regress. Complete resection is not mandatory. So even if only partial resection, again, since we believe that many of these tumors will regress on their own, um, is, um, is allowable. Chemotherapy and radiation are really reserved only for acute life or organ-threatened symptoms or at the time of um, recurrence. Principles for intermediate risk, again, this is a group of patients who do extremely well. There is a small risk for progression, um, but usually that's non-metastatic, and the overall survival for this group of patients remains greater than 90%. Surgery is generally used for biopsy to obtain biologic information about the tumor and is not needed for complete resection. So again, complete resection is not mandatory in these non-high-risk patients. When chemotherapy is used, anywhere from two to eight cycles have been used depending on whether there is presence of segmental chromosome aberration. Overall, the outcome remains excellent despite whether you use two cycles or more cycles of chemotherapy. And really, it's a response-adjusted um, type of therapy with more cycles being used to obtain at least a 50% regression in the size of the tumor. Radiation is not used routinely, but reserved for those with acute life or organ-threatening symptoms. For instance, someone who has severe spinal cord compression who might not be improving with their initial chemotherapy. Principles of high-risk therapy, this is much different than the other forms of therapy. This is very aggressive, multimodal um, therapy, which I like to think of in three phases. There's an induction phase with multi-agent chemotherapy, stem cell collection, and surgery. There's a consolidation phase that includes myeloablative therapy and post-myeloablative therapy, external beam radiation therapy, reg regardless of the extent of resection. And then post-consolidation therapy that includes biologic response modifiers isotretinoin, as well as immunotherapy. The role of surgery in neuroblastoma is to initially confirm the diagnosis and obtain those important biologic factors that I've already gone over and make histology and the presence of segmental chromosome aberration. Primary tumor resection to achieve at least a 50% reduction in the tumor mass can be used for lower intermediate risk tumors, but complete tumor resection is required for high-risk neuroblastoma. The goal always is to spare organs, even in the setting of high-risk neuroblastoma, whenever possible. The role of radiation treatment, again, there is a limited role in the non-high-risk, low- and intermediate-risk um, patients. While high-risk disease, there's a mandatory treatment of the primary tumor bed. It's usually the volume pre-surgical plus a margin. And then um, there are... Um, um, uh, there have been studies that are looking at the boost um, to residual gross tumors, uh, tumor, but that um, is still under investigation. So in general, relatively uh, lower doses than used for sarcomas, um, but all primary tumor sites do need to be irradiated for high-risk neuroblastoma. There is some use of radiation to metastatic sites um, um, that persist after um, induction, and in general, radiation is given after myeloblative therapy to avoid risks uh, such as sinusoidal obstructed syndrome um, during high-dose therapy. The role of chemotherapy in the treatment, we've really just talked about that. It's really reserved for the treatment of emergent symptoms in low-risk disease. 
moderate doses of chemotherapy, usually carboplatinum, vincristine, cyclophosphamide, and doxorubicin are used in intermediate risk disease, and then multi-agent high-dose chem chemotherapy is used for high-risk disease. And I put in some examples of um, studies that have shown that intensity improves outcome for high-risk neuroblastoma. Um, and then finally, um, the, know the role of biologic response modifiers in the treatment of neuroblastoma. There was a randomized trial that was done in the 1990s that looked at whether the addition of isotretinoin as a biologic modifier um, improved outcome after transplant or after aggressive chemotherapy compared to no further therapy. And those children who got isotretinoin had a decreased uh, risk for recurrent disease. There's been a subsequent study performed in the um, 2000 to 2009 within the children's oncology group that further showed that the addition of immunotherapy on top of isotretinoin improves the outcome for children with high-risk neuroblastoma. So now post-consolidation standard treatment is isotretinoin plus immunotherapy. Finally, um, the board would like you to be able to monitor the response for neuroblastoma. This is the international neuroblastoma response criteria. Um, the take-home point is that you have to have a response assessment of both the primary tumor, bone marrow disease, and bone disease to be able to come up with an overall response. There are a lot of um, inadequacies of the INRC, which was initially published in 1993. In particular, it did not really specify how to utilize MIBG. Um, so um, this has somewhat evolved um, with, um, uh, um, with time. Um, and hopefully this year we'll have published um, a revision to the INRC that um, you can learn about in two years if you choose to come back to uh, the review course. But I think the take home for the boards would be that you need to be able to take those three sites of disease in order to take all of that into consideration for overall response. And then I just put in um, a final table that just gives you some ideas or a quick way to look at uh, treatment strategies for neuroblastoma as you're studying for the boards. And then finally, know the complications and late effects of neuroblastoma and its treatment. Uh, surgery, obviously there's acute uh, morbidities related to the surgery, and then long-term organ removal or neuronal uh, damage radiation, organ dysfunction, um, fertility issues for those children who have large primary tumors whose ovaries are involved in the radiation field, altered musculoskeletal growth. Chemotherapy, um, autotoxicity is a big deal in children with high-risk neuroblastoma since the therapy is very platinum heavy. Um, and currently about 50% of children with high-risk neuroblastoma treated in North America require hearing aids after um, treatment. Cardiac toxicity, although less uh, severe than some of the other um, solid tumors because we don't use as much anth anthracyclines, infidelity, secondary malignancy. And then late effects of isotretinoin, there are some, is some data that that uh, relates to decreased bone uh, or causes decreased bone density. And then I put in some tables at the end of each of these sections that take each of these and tell you which slides um, these topics are covered under. All right, now moving forward to renal tumors of childhood. Um, this is a pretty broad topic. Obviously, most of the data will, on presentation will be on Wilms tumor, but I'll try to hit some of the other renal tumors um, of childhood. Renal tumors account for 7% of all childhood cancers, the most common being Wilms tumor, which is 95% of all renal tumors of childhood. Renal cell carcinoma is actually more common than Wilms tumor when we get into the adolescent and young and adult age. Wilms tumor has an incidence of 7.1 cases per 1 million. Um, it is more commonly seen in African Americans than Caucasians and least commonly seen in Asians um, across the ethnic spectrum. It also is an umbrinal tumor, and it also occurs in young children with a median age of um, about three to four years. There's a slight female predominance, um, and especially a higher predominance of bilateral disease occurring in females. Again, um, I took the topic of cytogenetic and molecular genetic abnormalities, and I divided it into germline aberrations and then somatic aberrations. 
Within the germline aberrations, I've taken the approach of, of t splitting it between overgrowth syndromes and non-overgrowth syndromes as a way of helping you remember some of these. There are many syndromes that have been associated with Wilms tumor. I tried to list them here, but I'm just going to go over two most common um, in each of the overgrowth and non-overgrowth syndromes. So I think everyone in this room would know that Beckwith-Wiedemann is associated with Wilms tumor. This is a loss of impr imprinting in the WT2 um, gene. These children have macroglossia, organomegaly, um, abdominal wall closure defects, hemihypertrophy, muscular hypertrophy. And 5 to 10 percent of children with Beckwith-Wiedemann develop Wilms tumor. Perlman syndrome um, is a fetal gigantism, visceral megaly. These patients have coarse facies, um, bilateral renal hamartomas, and nephroblastomatosis, and can also develop um, Wilm tumors. As I said, I list many, many more um, for you to uh, review. Um, it would be a mean test writer to come up with some of these for you to have to remember on the test, but I put them there for your education. Um, the non-overgrowth syndromes, the two most common are uh, Wagger, which is the WT1 gene product um, transcription factor that is um, mutated in this um, disorder. Um, nearly um, all the children can develop Wilms tumor. They also have aniridia, GU malformations, and mount mental retardation. Denise Drass is a germline point mutation in the WT1 um, gene. Um, these children have uh, nephropathy um, from birth, um, and nearly all of them develop Wilms tumor, um, such that many of these children go on to have early nephrectomies as part of their um, clinical management. Again, there is a whole host of other um, disorders um, that are non-overgrowth disorders, germline disorders that can be associated with Wilms tumor, um, Leframini being probably um, one that's very common to or unknown to the audience. Um, in renal cell carcinoma, there are also germline predisposing syndromes, um, the most common being von Hippel-Lindau and tuberous sclerosis. Um, I would suspect that those might be on the boards and uh, would be good to remember. The somatic mutations, interestingly enough, uh, similar to neuroblastoma, those um, genes that are seen in the germline mutations predisposing to Wilms tumor um, can also be seen as unique somatic mutations. So WT1 um, uh, mutations can occur somatically. If you see that, you need to remember that um, you should consider whether this patient might have also a germline mutation and um, um, genitourine urinary abnormalities um, might be a tip-off for that. Um, WT1 mutations are also seen in, uh, more commonly in bilateral Wilms tumor or in uni unilateral tumors with uh, nephrogenic rest. WT1 mutations are seen as somatic abnormalities as well. Um, again, remember that there are germline syndromes that are associated with aberrations in the WT2 gene, and so always consider that when seen on um, uh, somatic uh, evaluations. And then finally, the WTX on the X chromosome, which is known to play a role in kidney development, uh, can be inactivated in up to 30 percent of Wilms tumor, and it has not been associated with germline mutations to date. So this is just a pie diagram showing that the most common mutations are WT1, WT2, and WTX, and then there's a whole slew of other mutations that have been described in uh, Wilms tumor. Recognize the pathologic subtypes of renal tumors relative to the primary tumor and pattern of spread. So I'm going to go through this in two different ways. I think of these tumors as Wilms tumors or other renal tumors, and then within the Wilms, there are those that have favorable histology and those that have anaplastic histology. And then the other renal tumors that we see in children include the clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, rhabdoid tumor, renal cell carcinoma, and congenital mesoblastic nephroma. So Wilms tumor we'll start with. Um, it is an embryonic, embryonal um, tumor, and it resembles embryonic renal tissue. 
Um, the classic pathology um, has a triad of um, pathologic um, characteristics, which include, let's see if I can do this without turning the page, um, glomerular um, um, uh, evidence, tubular evidence, and then stromal evidence. So characteristics of those three things make it a Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor spread to the lymph nodes, the lungs, and the liver most commonly. It can go to brain, uh, bone, but rarely. Now, the significance of the presence of nephroblastomatosis in a patient with Wilms tumor. Um, nephroblastomatosis is nephrogenic rests, rests that are present in unilateral or contralateral kidney. If you just show a, patholo a pathologist a slide of nephrogenic rests and they don't know where that came from, they will not be able to distinguish it under the microscope from Wilms. It looks the same. The difference is that it hasn't formed yet into a measurable mass um, on the scan. The prognostic significance is that those children who have nephrogenic rests um, are at increased risk of recurrence. And so they require longer surveillance up until the age of 8 to 10 for recurrence of their Wilms tumor. Know the relationship between histologic pattern of Wilms tumor and prognosis. And this is where anaplasia comes into um, uh, 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 significance. Anaplasia is anaplastic nuclear changes that occur in the tumor cells of Wilms. Um, they have hyperchromasia um, and generally an increased mitotic um, rate. The distribution of these anaplastic nuclear changes determine the prognosis. So if they're focal within the tumor versus diffuse throughout the tumor samples has a prognostic significance with those children who have diffuse anaplasia having a much, much worse outcome. It is a marker of resistance to chemotherapy. So when we get into therapy, um, it really is a marker for needing more therapy for those children, regardless of the stage of tumor that they have, um, to improve the outcome for those children. Clear cell sarcoma is, uh, used to be considered under the unfavorable histology um, in very old um, nitwits uh, clinical trials. It is not Wilms. It is separate from Wilms, but is the second most common pediatric renal tumor. Um, it has um, a histology that's described as cords and nests of pale staining tumor cells with extracellular matrix. It can be confused with uh, Wilms tumor in pathology. Clinically, it differs in that it has a higher propensity to metastasize to bone, brain, and soft tissue. Um, it has a high recurrence rate um, and death rate, much different than Wilms tumor. Rhabdoid tumor is most commonly encountered in infants with renal tumors. Um, it's very rare after five years of age. Um, it is um, notable for lack of INI1 expression in tumor cells. And as you've heard previously, this can be associated with germline mutations and risks for other types of um, tumor cell tumors. Um, it metastasizes to the lungs, the liver, the lymph node, and other places in the abdomen, as well as to the brain. It is a very aggressive tumor and has an extremely poor prognosis. And then finally, congenital mesoblastic nephroma is usually detected perinatally or in the first year of life. It has two different histologic subtypes, the classic and the cellular uh, um, subtypes. It is classic for symptoms of hypertension and elevated calcium and renin um, and neonates. And um, the risk um, for recurrence is really defined in the cellular um, subtype um, and higher in those with advanced stage disease. Clinical presentation of renal cells, many times Wilms tumors in particular are asymptomatic. They're picked up when a caregiver is bathing a child or dressing a child and notices a flank mass. In those children who have symptoms, 40% will complain of abdominal pain, 20 to 30% will have fevers. The children can be anemic from necrosis and bleeding into their tumor. Um, they can also have gross hematuria from tumor extension into the renal pelvis. About a quarter of children will have hypertension related to um, um, involvement of renal vasculature. And then um, in patients with rhabdoid tumors or congenital mesoblastic nephroma, you can see hypercalcemia.
The congenital anomalies associated with Wilms tumor, this really gets back to all the slides on the germline mutations associated with Wilms tumors, but the things that you can see are aniridia, hemihypertrophy, GU malformations, and malformations of any type. And certainly, if you see the first three, you should consider workup for the syndromes that we discussed. Isolated hemihypertrophy can be seen with Wilms tumor. Um, and then going along with the whole hypothesis that many of these children may have germline mutations predisposing them to Wilms tumor, children with malformations are usually younger at diagnosis um, than those without associated malformations. The boards would like you to know the appropriate laboratory studies to determine the extent and metastatic spread of renal tumors. I have to say, I thought long and hard about how to answer this question because there really isn't a blood test um, that helps you decide if a patient has Wilms tumor and there really isn't a blood test that tells you whether the child has metastatic disease. But in general, in children who present with renal tumors, you should get a CBC because the child may be anemic from bleeding into their tumor. Your analysis, because hematuria may help you know if the tumor is involving the renal pelvis, renal function, liver function, because children can have liver metastases. There is a, um, a known association of abnormal von Willebrand's testing in children with neuroblast, uh, excuse me, with Wilms tumor due to uh, reduced multimer, um, von Willebrand's multimer plasma concentration. It's interesting because it is a clinical laboratory phenomenon and these children are generally not at risk for bleeding um, with surgery. So it is not really a recommended test, um, but just more of an uh, interesting fact. And then um, for children with clear cell sarcoma, bone marrow aspirin and biopsy should be done because those children can sometimes have bone marrow metastases. Um, imaging modalities, um, as I said, most common sites of um, metastases are the lung and liver. Um, so anatomic imaging to start with to look at lymph nodes and primary tumor site, ultrasound to evaluate for intravascular extension because many of these renal tumors can grow up into the renal vasculature and up into the IVC. Metastatic disease, lung is a big site of metastatic disease, and so lung uh, CT scans, chest CT scans should be done. Um, technetium scans for children with diagnosed with clear cell sarcoma to evaluate for bone um, disease, and then consideration of brain MRI, certainly in children with rhabdoid tumor, and consideration for those with clear cell sarcoma. I present here some samples of radiographs of children with Wilms tumor to try to really show that these are tumors that arise from the kidneys. So there's a classic claw sign that radiologists will talk about where there is normal renal tissue surrounding the mass, um, giving a claw-like effect. Um, bilateral disease obviously would make you highly suspicious of Wilms tumor and then um, examples of pulmonary metastases. The staging for Wilms, stage one, is confined to the kidney. So the renal capsule is intact. The tumor has not ruptured. It hasn't been biopsied. There's no involvement of the renal sinus vessels, and all lymph nodes that are sampled are negative. That is stage one disease. Stage two disease is completely resected tumor, um, but can have regional extension, cannot have lymph nodes involved. Stage three disease is a tumor that has lymph node involvement, is taken out piecemeal, has penetrated through the peritoneal surface, surface um, or has residual tumor after um, surgery. And then finally, stage four disease is, are those children with hematolog uh, hematogenous tumor spread. So these are children who have metastatic sites, lung, liver, bone, brain, or lymph nodes that are not in the um, drainage of the kidney, um, and this occurs in approximately 10% of children with Wilms tumor. And then bilateral disease is tumor in both sides, and this again is in about 10% of children with Wilms tumor and is more commonly associated with children that, with known nephroblastomatosis or associated congenital malformations. <laughs> 
There is a staging system that is different used in Europe, um, and importantly, it is a staging system after chemotherapy, and that would likely be the main take-home point, but I have included it here for you. In general, it's similar to the staging system that's used in North America, but it is performed after initial chemotherapy because surgery is performed after initial chemotherapy. The evolution of Wilms trimmer is really one of those success stories in pediatric oncology, and it's really the advent of first radiation treatment and then chemotherapy that has have brought us to today's excellent outcome for children um, with renal tumors. The general approach is really set nearly two decades ago um, for children with Wilms tumor, and everything that we're doing now is really just tweaking this balance of trying to maintain the excellent outcome that we have while minimizing late effects for children with renal tumors. Um, in general, the treatment algorithm is initial nephrectomy followed by chemotherapy and in some patients, radiation treatment. The role of surgery um, is paramount in the treatment of renal tumors. Radical nephrectomy with lymph node sampling um, is advised in the majority of tumors with the hope that there is not tumor rupture um, at the time of surgery. Hyler and periodic lymph node sampling is um, highly recommended, even if the lymph nodes are normal. Um, and then um, routine exploration of the contralateral kidney is not required. Um, gross hematuria may make you think of more extension into the renal pelvis um, or into the ureter, and in those cases, cystoscopy may also be performed prior to uh, attempt at nephrectomy. There are indications for renal sparing surgery. Um, this would be in children who have found to have a solitary functioning kidney. Obviously, you wouldn't want to do a complete nephrectomy in those children. Likewise, in those children with a horseshoe kidney. If you know the patient has a predisposition to bilateral tumors or has bilateral tumors, then uh, renal sparing surgery instead of a complete radical nephrectomy um, is recommended. Radiation treatment um, is really um, uh, um, recommended only for those children with more advanced stages disease, so stage three or stage four, or those children who have evidence of anaplasia. In children with clear cell sarcoma or rhabdoid tumors, the radiation is um, required in all stages of disease. This is post-operative flank radiation for the majority of children. Whole abdomen radiation is required if there is rupture outside of the tumor bed. And then whole lung radiation is required for children with lung metastases with a big uh, asterisk there. Um, we'll talk about in a few slides um, work that has shown that perhaps we can eliminate radiation therapy for those children who have pulmonary metastases with rapid response. And then um, radiation really has a limited role in renal cell carcinoma. So the role of chemotherapy, um, chemotherapy is recommended in all tumors after primary nephrectomy. The drugs and the duration are really dependent on the stage of the tumor and the genetics of the tumor, as we'll talk about. The mainstay agents are vincristine, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin. Additional agents in the setting of more aggressive tumors include cyclophosphamide, etoposide, and carboplatinum. And then similar to radiation, chemotherapy has a really limited role in the treatment of renal cell carcinoma. So um, know the role of chemotherapy in treatment. There is also a role for pre-surgical chemotherapy in um, uh, special cases. This would be for those children with synchronous bilateral Wilms, Wilms tumor with a solitary kidney, extension of the tumor such that the tumor is felt to be non-resectable, um, or pulmonary compromise due to extensive pulmonary metastases. In these children, it's recommended that chemotherapy is started initially and that surgical intervention is delayed for 6 to 12 weeks um, with hopefully resolution of some of these symptoms. Going by stage, um, I've tried to develop some tables for you to look at um, and try to show you today, or, or at least to pick for you today, some of the ways to think about this. In low stage disease, so stage two, stage one and stage two disease, in general, two drugs, vincristine and dactinomycin, is um, sufficient. 
In babies with very small stage one tumors, there is even evidence that those children can be just observed after resection or use vincristine alone. Once you start adding in anaplasia, then you have to consider the use of radiation therapy or the addition of an uh, uh, doxorubicin chemotherapy. So for stage one disease, radiation is added for focal anaplasia and both doxorubicin and radiation is added for diffuse anaplasia. So I show you here the regimen EE4A when one of your older attendings tells you to just go look up the Wilms tumor EE4A. This is it. It's been christine and actinomycin. Um, one of the um, corrections is please look at your um, slides and change that 0.5 milligrams per kilogram to 0.05 milligrams per kilogram because I would hate to be responsible for overdosing someone's um, then christine. Um, for stage two disease, the same regimen, EE4A, is used for those with favorable histology, so just vincristine, dactinomycin, no radiation. Once you get anaplasia, then you add in both radiation and more chemotherapy. Focal anaplasia is the addition of doxorubicin. Diffuse anaplasia requires more aggressive chemotherapy. And again, this is the Nitwitz regimen DD4A, which adds doxorubicin in, in addition to vincristine and actinomycin. And then for stage three, we use this DD4A, all three agents plus radiation treatment in the majority of patients, um, both with favorable histology and focal anaplasia. And then those patients with diffuse anaplasia use um, additional agents on top of those three agents um, because of um, worsening prognosis. And then stage four disease, likewise, all three chemotherapeutic agents, vincristine, dactinomycin, doxorubicin, plus radiation um, for those with favorable histology or focal anaplasia, and then um, diffuse anaplasia requires different chemotherapy. So the prognostic features and their associated prognosis in renal tumors. We've talked about this, and I've displayed this in some of the treatments we just talked about. The stage of disease is important um, for prognosis. Tumor size in infants, so those infants with very small tumors have an excellent prognosis, and we can consider giving them even less therapy. Histologic features, so diffuse anaplasia has a much worse outcome, and those with um, clear cell sarcoma um, and rhabdoid uh, tumors have worse outcome. Molecular features that are important are the evidence of loss of heterozygosity at 1P and 16Q, and there are now um, several um, manuscripts which show that this um, Coexistence of loss of heterozygosity relates to higher risk for recurrence for treat patients across all um, stages, so stage one and two, as well as three and four. Those children who are older, adolescents and young adults, tend to have a worse outcome, and those children with bilateral disease. Tailoring the therapy according to prognostic factors, we've talked about already renal sparing surgery for those children with bilateral disease. Um, it's important now to look at the genomic status of disease, and I'll show you some examples of how um, non-randomized trials done both in Europe and in North America have shown that perhaps more aggressive chemotherapy should be given for those children who have combined LOH at 16Q and 1P. Uh, metastatic response rate in the lungs, as I'll show you, um, can affect whether we need to give radiation to that site. And then finally, histology is important, and those children with diffuse anaplasia um, have a worse outcome and need more aggressive chemotherapy with the addition of carboplatinum, cyclophosphamide, and atoposide. Okay, so here's an example of what we're doing now in North America. Again, this was studied prospectively, but in a non-randomized form. But as you can see, you take stage one disease or stage two disease, and once LOH is seen, um, since retrospective studies had shown that those children have worse outcome with higher risk of recurrence, they are now receiving doxorubicin in addition to standard vincristine and dactinomycin. Similarly, those children with stage three or four disease with LOH are now receiving the addition of cyclophosphamide and atoposide um, on top of the standard vincristine, dactinomycin, and doxorubicin to decrease risk for recurrence. <clears throat> 
And then understanding the therapy of pulmonary metastases. So in North America, up until just recently, we had always delivered radiation therapy to the lungs. As you can imagine, this could have long, uh, significant long-term effects for pulmonary function in these young children giving, getting total lung radiation. In Europe, they had um, taken on uh, the tack that those children who had complete resolution of their metastatic disease by week, week six of therapy did not require radi lung radiation and ended up with very similar outcome than what we had seen with patients with stage four disease in North America. Um, and, um, but what was important was that they were giving much higher doses of doxorubicin. A retrospective analysis in some of the NITWITS trials looked at um, whether this could be the case for children treated with uh, for stage four disease. So in the advent of calling metastatic disease by CT scans, um, there were, was the option for investigators to utilize the addition of doxorubicin or radiation or neither for children who had lung metastases that were only seen on CT scans and not on chest X-ray. And what I show you here is that the only difference in this analysis um, that could be seen is that the better outcome was for those children who received doxorubicin in addition to vincristine and actinomycin and not in whether they received radiation therapy. So this led to a recently completed trial um, in the children's oncology group, which simil similar to the European stance said that radiation therapy could be eliminated for those children who did not have, oh, excuse me, who had resolution of lung metastases um, by week six, and their outcomes seemed to be similar to historical controls. On the converse, those children who still had pulmonary metastases went on to get lung irradiation and also got more aggressive chemotherapy. Um, the boards would like you to know the management of an infant with mesoblastic nephroma. Um, the management is nephrectomy. Um, that is usually adequate therapy for the majority of patients. Um, although patients at increased risk for local and eventually metastatic recurrence um, are those patients with stage three disease, so incomplete resection, cellular subtype, or three months or older at diagnosis. And it is recommended in those children that adjuvant chemotherapy um, be considered. And then the management of patients with recurrent tumors um, really depends on the treatment that the patient has received prior to their recurrence. So those children with favorable Wilms tumor who were treated with only vincristine and dactinomycin are, um, represent about 30% of the recurrent Wilms tumors. Those children can be successfully treated with subsequent surgical excision, subsequent radiation therapy, and chemotherapy that usually takes into um, use cyclophosphamide and atoposide in addition to vincristine and doxorubicin. Children who received more aggressive treatment, so those who relapse after three or more agents or those who relapse and have anaplasia have a much worse outcome. Um, and the treatment recommended for those children is much more aggressive. So if you relapse after three drugs, then the recommendation is to use um, alternative drugs, usually cyclophosphamide, etop etoposide, alternating with carboplatinum and etoposide surgery and radiation treatment. Alternative regimens have included ICE, and there are non-randomized study reports of autologous hematopoietic stem cell transplant for those children with high-risk recurrence, especially those with anaplastic tumors. The complications of therapy are um, really primarily related to the treatments uh, that we use. So cardiotoxicity for those children who receive anthracyclines, secondary malignancy, hepatotoxicity um, primarily felt to be due to dactinomycin and radiation, um, infertility, especially in those children who require whole abdominal radiation, um, and then renal dysfunction, especially in those children with bilateral tumors who have ongoing um, needs for renal sp sparing surgeries. And then the complications of radiation therapy are across all types of tumors, and they impact um, musculoskeletal growth, liver dysfunction, renal dysfunction, and secondary malignancies. And then finally, again, um, I gave you these tables that take each of the questions from the boards and tells you what slides um, the information is given to you. I thank you very much for your attention.